everyone present. Uh, it's unfortunate that all of us can't be there in person. Uh, we'd have loved to be part of the conversations that are happening, uh, but I'm glad that we have three very prominent uh, uh, leaders and panelists with us today from different parts of the world. Uh, we've got Dr. Mauro, uh, who represents Alive uh, in East Africa, uh, the Rally Network, which is the regional education leadership learning initiative. Uh, we've got Desi from Socialpreneur ID Indonesia, uh, and we've got Michael Stevenson, uh, who's part of OECD and also part of Global Education Leaders Partnership. Uh, I would love to go through a much longer resume of each of the prominent and eminent panelists, uh, but I rather that we actually hear from them, uh, uh, their thoughts. The focus of this particular panel is uh, to look at what is happening in the global south in other parts of the world uh, around the idea of transforming education uh, towards thriving for every child and what role has life skills, social emotional learning played in that journey. Uh, and the hope is that uh, we will see that this is now increasingly becoming a global movement towards transforming education. Uh, and what's happening in India is also a reflection of what's happening in many other parts of the global south. Uh, so again, uh, welcome to the three panelists. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm going to start off with Desi. Uh, Desi, give us a context of uh, the challenges that young people are facing in Indonesia and how that understanding led you to start Socialpreneur and, and, and what are you trying to do at Socialpreneur? Thanks a lot, uh, Vishal. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, Socialpreneur Indonesia. Actually, in 2013, when we started uh, to understand what's going on in Indonesia education system, then we identified there are uh, five critical challenges in Indonesian education system. That's about uniformity in thinking, a lack of practicality, about decision-making skills, about problem-solving, critical thinking. And, but another thing is about character qualities, such as uh, empathy, such leadership, ethics, and et cetera. So what we found is, uh, in the long term, when the students graduate from university, that's really hard for them to adapt to changes. So we start to create a club of, uh, for youth to uh, get uh, uh, to learn about uh, life skills and entrepreneurship. But why we use entrepreneurship educations and social innovation as a tools to improve their quality? that because of, according to World Giving Index, Indonesia is the most, uh, most generous country in the world. And we also, um, uh, Indonesia itself is uh, one of the best uh, country to become social entrepreneur. And according to our studies, then we found that uh, there are a lot of good people in, Indone in Indonesia, especially youth, but the, uh, the problem is they don't know how to channel their good intention. So that why, that's why we start to create a programs for uh, students from primary schools into university levels to channel their energy and good intentions. But at the same time, they improve their quality, uh, quality of life. They start to learn also how to become a part of solutions in their surroundings. So the idea is how to create a responsibility of each citizen in the future. So what we, that's what we call it as a responsible ecosystem. Because we talk about the ecosystem, so that's why since beginning, we are not working alone. So we start to build the strategic partnership from beginning. So all uh, stakeholders work collaboratively to achieve what we, want, uh, what we want to achieve, that one, the, the responsible ecosystem. So that's why it's like, uh, we are not focused directly into the learners. We also uh, start, uh, we also want every stakeholders take a part in the whole journey. So uh, last year, then the model is become a national model 
because it's adopted by Ministry of Education. And then we, uh, in these two years, last year and this year, we even amplify our work and we reach more than half million uh, university students. They can learn exactly like uh, the model that we develop, how they solve the problems in the surrounding and then also become a part of solution. So it's what we think is like, that's also bring a courage and then also they have, uh, they, they know that they can do something, even the young. So that's the idea. And then, yeah, and we are very happy with that, but we know a lot of things that we can improve uh, from the model itself. Okay, I think that's, uh, yeah, <laughs> so well, thank you. Thank you, Desi. Thank you for giving us that background. Uh, and looking at, uh, you know, what, what, what really excited me is that you're looking at youth as drivers of change uh, and then using social entrepreneurship and social innovation as an approach uh, to help young people build the skills and capacity so they can then serve their communities. Uh, that's, that's a fantastic approach. And the fact that you've kind of now scaled it at a national level. Uh, Maybe just a quick second question, Desi. Uh, so what are some of the challenges that these young people are then addressing in their communities? What are some of the ideas that they're picking up? Actually, now, honestly, the issues here in Indonesia, we start to lose our, um, uh, we, we know everything, but we don't know how you do use the knowledge into something useful. That's in Indonesia, especially uh, through the social media and everything. So what we, 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 we are not against uh, technology and everything, but we want them to learn how to use the things in their surrounding and then become a tools to support uh, the solution, uh, to support, uh, tackle the challenge in the surrounding. So if you're asking about the biggest challenge now in Indonesia, that's the use of social media and technology. It's definitely a challenge in many parts of the world, Desi. So uh, definitely a lot to learn from your initiative. Thank you. Uh, let me move on to Dr. Mauro. Uh, Dr. Mauro, the Regional Education Learning Initiative, Rally, uh, yeah, it's a network that was set up in East Africa. Uh, today has uh, over some 70 odd members, I understand. Uh, what was the need to build such a network uh, in East Africa? Uh, and what is the role of the network itself? Um, thank you very much, Vishal. Um, the Regional Education Learning Initiative was born um, officially in 2017. And um, the starting point for of this initiative, I believe that was a, a situation that was going on for quite a number of years um, um, in Uganda, but in general in East Africa. Since the beginning of this century, there has been an explosion in the rates of uh, um, access to education, meaning that um, basically we reached almost almost all the countries have reached the one hundred percent of um, access rate. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, this shift has been detrimental in terms of uh, quality of education, the system was actually not ready to, to have such a huge number of uh, kids in the schools. And so a lot of problems in the education system and that uh, I believe we all know from the overcrowding of the classrooms to the fact that teachers are not prepared. And there has been a sort of slogan going on, like, uh, well, yes, our children are in school, but uh, uh, why aren't they learning? Why aren't children learning? Uh, because all uh, the, the the big assessments that has been conducted, uh, they all say the same thing: that only thirty percent of uh, of the students that navigate through the primary school level basically know how to read uh, a text of P two, uh, and we know how much this foundational learning, uh, the lack of this foundational learning, impacts on the um, life uh, and the learning outcomes of the children. And uh, concurrently, in the past 20 years, there has been a, a huge effort coming from uh, different uh, CSOs and uh, a lot of donors uh, pumping in a lot of resources uh, in, in East Africa 
and uh, yet it seems that uh, we do not see much change. Of, of course, there is a change, but uh, it's like uh, it's difficult to understand exactly the impact, and especially it's more and more challenging to dissect and identify and describe the uh, the kind of uh, uh, initiatives that really work. Um, in 2017, a number of organizations now that were more than 70, they gathered together and they just asked themselves, okay, we are, we're, I mean, if we consider the, just the, the beneficiaries of this organization, we are, we are passing the, billion, the millions of uh, children, okay? So how is it possible that uh, our voice is not heard and is not really contributing to the system shift that is necessary to have all these children in the classroom and learning? And so the aim of this organization was uh, to stay together, to, to bring together the expertise of the different CSOs uh, in order to build more evidence for advocating, uh, for advocating a system shift that should occur, should take place. Uh, of course, the system is always uh, under scrutiny and uh, under accusation sometimes about the fact that, that things are not working. And um, for very, very many years, uh, there's been a sort of uh, a defensive attitude of the systems uh, towards uh, the inputs coming from the CSOs, uh, because they always felt like uh, the CSOs are coming in to... Uh, with accusations uh, or without uh, providing any solutions that keep on telling us things are not working but they don't tell us what we should do in order to work and so the aim of this uh, um, of this initiative of rally initiative is really to generate evidence and to bring together the voice of uh, so many organizations uh, to help uh, the uh, the system understand uh, maybe how we can work together to better move in a direction that brings uh, positive results for the kids. And uh, why life skills? Why Alive? Alive was born as an assessment for life skills and values, and now it's called Action for Life Skills and Values. And the initial aim of this organization is uh, um, to generate evidence in the field of life skills and values because. Um, well, uh, the market requires for them. The entrepreneurs, uh, they're telling they're telling you, okay, it's true, we need the technical skills, but the technical skills, we can teach them. But uh, what is lacking is really what uh, is called uh, uh, the, the transferable skills or the, the transversal skills that uh, allow the children to come to work on time, uh, to be uh, pro uh, I mean, to be propositive, to be critical thinker, to be problem solvers, uh, to be active, uh, part, actively part of our organization. And at the same time, we have the society. The parents are lamenting the fact that the children are not uh, respecting anymore their background, their tradition, but especially they're sort of lost. And this is uh, due even to the fact that there's been a huge urbanization, uh, the, the, the living behind of all um the the traditional system that was basically helping the children to grow with the backbone and in all these uh, the life skills and values uh, um, kept on popping up in all the east african curricula uh, all the system now are competency based uh, systems in education and all require that together with the knowledge that the children acquire even the transversal skills uh, but up to now one there is not clear evidence of uh, what works in nurturing these skills. There's not even clear evidence of, uh, there was not even clear evidence or a clear, a clear um, understanding of how, how to measure these skills. And you know that in our system that is uh, that has examination that uh, have such a high stake for the society and for the children to progress, it's paramount to try to understand uh, uh, how to assess these kids, because if these kids are not assessed in the end of cycle examinations, it's very, very difficult to generate any kind of shift in uh, uh, the daily activities that happen in the classroom. And so how to assess these skills? So far, in our context, all the tools that were used to assess the skills were mostly imported. And uh, there was no expertise generated in East Africa and present in East Africa. Most of the expertise is coming from the Western world that comes, pops in, come, uh, gives you the results and goes back with all their competencies. 
um, I'm generalizing and hope that you don't mind uh, my sweeping uh, <laughs> my sweeping statement. But uh, I mean, uh, that was a little bit of the situation. And so the Alive is, was born as an attempt to have contextualized tools that uh, uh, speak to the context and especially that uh, this journey of uh, generation of evidence is a journey that is born in the context um, and uh, that has got uh, at the same time the rigor that is requested from this kind of research. And so, you know, just to cut the story short, otherwise I can speak for the rest of the hour, um, we conducted an assessment with a, a household based with a 45, uh, over 45,000 of adolescents in East Africa to generate a huge uh, uh, set of evidence and uh, it attracted a lot of attention of the government uh, who has participated during the whole process uh, and now the government uh, is asking us uh, or the government of the of the jurisdictions uh, we are working uh, Uganda Kenya Tanzania they are, these governments are asking us uh, to help them build their own capacity to assess and to nurture the skills uh, so basically right now we are working with them to generate uh, this kind of uh, a system shift that we're all, all hoping for, for the good of our children. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Morrow. As you were speaking about the genesis of uh, Rally and Alive, uh, it almost seemed very similar to the genesis of the Life Skills Collaborative. Uh, very similar questions that uh, we were sitting on uh, and very similar approaches, you know, investing in assessments that are contextualized to India, uh, building an understanding of what life skills means in, in the context of India and how do we get support governments to adapt the idea of uh, mainstreaming life skills in formal education systems. Uh, so it's wonderful to see that these very unique initiatives in East Africa and India have very similar intentions. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, and we hope we can find more avenues to learn from each other uh, and collaborate. Uh, I'll, I'll come to Michael now. Michael, uh, you and me, I and some of us have been involved in this very exciting project over the last year and a half on looking at uh, learning ecosystems in the global south. Uh, I would love for you to you know, talk a little bit about what is the need for us to study learning ecosystems in the global south, uh, what learning ecosystems did we study, and what were some of the insights that came from that study? Thank you, Vishal, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Vishal, I'm a little worried about the stability of my internet here in Budapest, so wave at me if it's not good enough. Yes, as you say, it's almost two years since we began this research um, across Latin America, Africa, and of course, India, Indonesia, and Bangladesh, looking at learning ecosystems. and. To answer your question, I think we sense that the question that the Brookings asked, how do national education systems in the global south quickly accelerate to maturity was almost the wrong question. It assumed that the destination was a set of national education systems that looked a lot like the OECD's national education system. Um, it might take 100 years, so how do we make that into 60? Felt like the wrong question. Why don't we begin on the ground and see what's going on? And three organizations came together to do exactly that. Your own, Dream a Dream, um, the Global Education Leaders Partnership, and Learning Plans Institute out of Paris. And after sifting literally a hundred incredible initiatives, we settled on 11 that we felt exhibited very similar characteristics and we called them learning ecosystems, capital L, capital E. Um, and we found three or four of those in Latin America. Um, not least in some very troubled places, including uh, post-conflict Colombia. Um, we found them in Africa, 
I don't know what to do if it's, if it's unstable, but um, tell me if you just need to stop and go somewhere else and um, I'll understand and come back later. Uh, it's good now. It's good now. Yeah, you just came back. Okay. Please continue. Um, and then we, thank you. And then we found great ecosystems um, uh, where you all are today. They had two things in common. One was purpose and the other was the what, how they acted in the world. The purpose first. It felt to us as though all of these ecosystems were interested in the thriving, the flourishing of each child, despite sometimes very sharp adversity. Poverty, of course, but also conflict, violence, gangs, drugs, misogyny and abuse, um, a generational low esteem for education, effects of environmental degradation, refugee issues. There is no shortage of factors that build towards adversity. And in each case, these ecosystems were looking to build the life skills of young people that would enable them to thrive despite all of that. But the other thing they seemed to have in common was how they went about it. Um, always a diversity of learning providers. Um, a whole, whole groups of organizations often forgetting their differences, banding together to provide extraordinary learning and education. Um, and therefore putting their funding together, their governance together, their values together, and definitely using quite progressive approaches to teaching, learning, and assessment. This was not a lot of kids behind desks in a classroom, um, but always pushing towards life skills uh, with problem solving in your context at the center. Um, I think one of the interesting things has been the different kinds of relationship of these initiatives to the formal education system. So if I think about the work in Delhi, Vishal, that you know so well, where the happiness curriculum has been center stage, that grows right out of the formal education system. If I think of um, Fundacion Misangre in Bogota, learning circles, kids sitting down with former guerrillas, um, policy makers to develop a new vision, new institutions for Bogota and for Colombia, that's right outside the formal education system. And I think some of what we've seen, for example, in Northwest Africa and Ghana is a kind of hybrid. So this is important that um, you can locate your learning ecosystem in different relationships to the formal system. Um, and uh, just to say, where next with this work? Because having found these incredible institutions, um, often very young, very ambitious, huge potential. Um, how can our work, Bichal, um, support their development and grow more? And I think we'll do that if we can over the next year through a kind of transitional phase, recognizing that we can help build capacity really by region, capital R, around the world to develop this kind of initiative. Recognizing that there are great similarities between these initiatives, depending on if you're in Latin America or Africa. Um, uh, in, I think there are important things to do um, in a further substantive stage. I think there's a lot to do with research, evidence, data, measurement. Um, Dr. Morrow is, is, is absolutely right that unless you measure, in the end, you run out of steam. Um, and that will allow us to engage policymakers. I think there's a lot to do with helping build leadership capacity because the leadership of these initiatives is lonely to help tell the story of learning ecosystems, to build their place, their narrative in the wider world. Uh, I think we need to codify different models of curriculum, if that's even the right word. 
uh, Michael, we, looks like we lost you. Uh, but maybe it might help if you put off your video. Maybe we'll get better bandwidth. Yeah. Uh, it looks like we've lost Michael. Maybe he'll, he'll, he'll come back in a few minutes to close out his points. Uh, but one of the things that uh, you know, Michael was pointing out at is the role of integrating a lot of these initiatives and solutions within the public education system. Uh, so Desi, it would be great to understand from you what, what needed to be done to help your initiative kind of become a national level initiative. You know, what were the resistances that you had to work through with the government to make that happen. Uh, Michael is back. Michael, uh, we lost in you in the last few seconds. Uh, if you want to finish your point, it'll be amazing. Uh, and then I just had a question for Desi. Um, well, if you had to lose me, that was the right moment because I definitely run out of steam. So um, I hope that gave you a good picture of what we've been doing, Vishal. Um, but happy to come back later in the conversation. And maybe just to pick out, if I do and if there's time, some of the parallels with what's going on um, in the OECD sphere, also in pursuit of education for human flourishing. Yes, uh, I, I would love to come back to that, Michael. Uh, definitely, I think there's very rich insights for this group uh, in the work that the OECD is doing. Uh, but let me quickly have Desi. Uh, the question I asked Desi is that uh, one of the things that uh, is coming out in the conversation uh, is the role that public education systems play. Uh, so how did Desi you know, kind of take this work uh, to a national level? Uh, so Desi, it'll be great to hear your insights on that. And same question to Dr. Moro too. How did uh, Relay become uh, something that now is working with the public education system itself. Yeah, Desi, first to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Fisha. And actually, it's uh, it's really a big challenge for us at the beginning because it's like how uh, to to combine uh, in curriculum uh, formal education, informal and non-formal educations. And another thing, because the biggest challenge in Indonesia, we are with more than uh, 273 million and 17,000 islands and more than 900 tribes, that's diversity. So what we are doing is like we create a different pilot project in different part of Indonesia and uh, with, the, uh, with the different framework. So that's exactly like uh, Michael said, we have a different type of interventions. Then uh, like uh, Mauro said, yes, we are measure everything. We measure everything. We see what is uh, the connection between each uh, framework. And when we go into the national levels, then uh, finally last year, we create a, a national framework uh, for, uh, because uh, the new policy in 2020, that's about having uh, students to go beyond the classroom for three semesters for higher education and also for a student in K-12, they can go uh, and study outside of the classroom. So we use that kind of policy and then uh, to embed what we are doing because uh, what we are doing is hybrid that can go uh, into the curriculum, that can go outside of uh, the curriculum, non-formal and informal. So what we are doing is like uh, we create uh, one national framework where everyone in all over Indonesia can create and then have uh, uh, autonomy to create based on their own context because we cannot make like one size fits all. So that's why it's like it can become uh, it become a national uh, a framework right now. Yes, that's a wonderful insight. Thank you, thank you, Desi. Uh, Dr. Mauro. Um, well, the Lev Initiative uh, was uh, very instrumental also for understanding uh, how best we can collaborate with the public sector in order to create this kind of shift and change. Because at, at the end of the day, we all have the same aim. We are all trying to reach the same uh, the same goal, so it doesn't make sense to be separate. But um, what it took for us uh, to have uh, the system on board it uh, since the beginning, when we started the, the old program, instead of waiting for the results to come out, 
we went, uh, we reached out to the different governments and we invited the governments to be part of the whole journey. Uh, it took almost uh, one and a half years to develop the tools and to validate the tools. And during all this process, there was what we called an academy, but basically a group of people, almost 50 people from the, from the four different jurisdictions, because we have Zanzibar that has a separate uh, system, um, education system uh, to, to the mainland of uh, Tanzania. And so we consider them four jurisdictions. We have representatives of the government of the four jurisdictions participating in this academy, participating in this journey of developing the tools. And then we also invited them, the, the representative of the government to come with us during the assessment. And when you take them to the field and they see what's happening and they, they hear the words of the family members, they hear the, the questions of the students and, their, and the answers of the students. When you present the results, the results are not coming onto them as if they are a, a shovel just, uh, just pushed over their head. It's, uh, it's like, okay, these are results that we build together somehow. And uh, the problem is not to blame the, the blame game, who's the fault? But the the problem becomes okay. How do we go? How do we move forward from here? And so, it was a, a kind of natural progression from the participation in the first phase to now the, having them asking us to help them, for example, refine tune their curriculum or revise their assessment uh, system or integrate a, a methods to nurture these life skills at. Uh, for the teacher education at the level of pre-service, for example, which is amazing because it's not it's it's what we wanted, but uh, we never expected, we never knew how it would have come out. So, uh, as as even uh, um, Desi was saying, it's not one solution for all. Every country has its own pathways, its own. Uh, uh, positive feelings or negative feelings. Some uh, some organi some organizations within or some agencies within the Ministry of Education are responding much faster and much better in some countries than uh, and and maybe uh, slower in other countries. And so we follow their pace. In Uganda, we have the Curriculum Development Center that is very much participating into all this process, and so they keep on asking us interventions about how to help them reform the system from the curriculum point of view. In, uh, in uh, Kenya, we have the teacher education system that is pushing. In Zanzibar, we have the all, for, luckily, the, the new Minister of Education was a former member of Rally, and so she is absolutely extremely um, willing for us to enter into the pre-service teaching, into the, the, the curriculum development in all uh, the sector and the same for Tanzania instead we're starting from the curriculum. Um, yeah, we wonderful. move on according to how the system asks system. us to move somehow. But Actually, uh, I believe that it yeah. is a positive uh, a positive experience of um, of uh, mutual um, trust and mutual collaboration for the common good. Yes, absolutely. And it's so important as an insight that we we move at the pace that the system wants us to move and uh, while we're trying to kind of create uh, uh, disruptive change, we also have to listen to where the system is at. Uh, so thank you for sharing that insight. Uh, I know we got just about 10 minutes left, and I want to ask this question to Michael for sure. Uh, so Michael, OECD remarkably has been working on this amazing initiative on human flourishing. Uh, so tell us a little bit about it and why that's so important in the world of education transformation right now. And then we'll probably open it up to the audience for a couple of questions before we close. Oh, looks like we lost Michael again. Okay, well, while we wait uh, for, for Michael to come back, uh, maybe- Thanks, Peter. Oh, there you are. Can you okay, hear me? Great. Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Oh. Finland. Singapore, Australia, British Columbia. So what we're doing is asking questions about the purposes of education. Um, we know, if we're honest, that the purpose of education, as the European countries matured with America, 
became education for the labor market. Maybe we didn't say it, but it's what we meant. Um, but here we are wondering if that's any longer the right orientation. You know, education in the service of a problematic global economy, education that really privileges those young people with analytic skills who do well in exams, um, and education that doesn't address a central problem, which is a loss of meaning in people's lives. So we've begun to think about different purposes for education, and we call it education for human flourishing. You ask, what is flourishing? And you go back to some very, very ancient ideas about happiness, about meaning, about relationships, about engagement, and yes, prosperity and success, but how do you define that? And you think about an education that would allow people to achieve those things. Um, no one's going to sweep away foundational literacies like maths and science, and shouldn't. But what can we build on top? Um, and we think two things. Firstly, the orientation of learning might be about finding your purpose in life through the learning process, um, through sensing your world, understanding your own motivations, prototyping new solutions. And we think that it could take new competencies uh, that would be constitutive of a flourishing life. Problem solving, yes, but adaptive problem solving. Um, taking your experience and solving one problem and addressing it, taking account of wider interests, not just your own, as you take decisions. Um, and thirdly, and there's a spiritual dimension to this, aesthetic perception, uh, beginning to understand what is beautiful and best in our world um, and responding to it and reframing your own values and orientations uh, as you look at something beautiful. So that is the beginning of new thinking in the OECD space. It will take some years to come to maturity, but it's a very serious conversation. And isn't it remarkable, the parallels with this conversation? You know, in the Global South, you might be talking about education for human flourishing through learning ecosystems. In the OECD sphere, you might be talking about education for human flourishing through formal national systems. But the direction is convergent. So I'll stop there. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for sharing that. Uh, so uh, I just asked the organizers if there is a way for the audience to ask a couple of questions. Uh, Do see a few hands up. Uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Parul Chet, and I'm from uh, an organization called Chaishav from Gujarat. Uh, having worked with children for over three decades at the grassroots level, we work with the rights-based approach. And uh, over the period of time, uh, our first and experience uh, show us that we need to consider life skill as a very fundamental rights of children. They must get it. It is not like a space where we, we can think about it. It is a matter of right for each and every child to get it. And second is, I also, that is one thing that I want to say. And Second thing is, uh, when we are talking about, uh, when we say it from the rights, it is uh, leading to their empowerment with their uh, active engagement, uh, enhancing their agency through life skills, which is also equal to kind of right to participation. But by teaching them safe decision making and all, we are also ensuring their right to protection. So I feel there is a lot of synergy and need of that convergence between life skills and uh, with the, with the rights-based approach. So this is something that how can we do this in, in, in our approach and in the way we deliver it. Uh, this is something that my, it's not 
question, question, but this is my proposal and I would like to definitely get the response from the experts on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Parulji. Uh, maybe a couple more questions if there are. Uh, and if you could also tell us who the question is addressed to, just help us focus on that. Okay, looks like we've got only one question. Uh, anyone want to take a dig at it? Uh, how do we bring together life skills and a rights-based approach? I can shoot something that pops up in my mind, Hello? actually. Oh, sorry. Hello. Is uh, a question coming? So okay. I'm Mukul Goel uh, from Quality Education Asia. And we are working on the curriculum design for this new NCF 2023. And uh, we are wondering how to integrate this in all the lesson plans of academics and everything, because we are talking about integrated approach. But uh, when we do the lesson planning, and it will be a matter of fact that we have counselors, separate counselors for life skills in schools. But how to integrate it with all the lessons? Because life skills cannot be something which can be taught alone. So my question is, what are your suggestions to integrate it in? into the curriculum. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mukulji. Uh, so uh, Dr. Morrow, probably you could uh, address the first question uh, and then maybe Desi, you could come in with the second question. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I think that uh, the point that uh, Madam was making about the integration of uh, life skills and, uh, and uh, the rights of people is uh, fundamentally correct, is fundamentally true. And I'm saying this because um, um, I, when I speak about the rights, uh, I, always ask, I always ask myself, uh, where are rights coming from? Are they coming from the UN or they're coming from uh, our common way of living? And so if you just dig into the rights, uh, you understand that uh, there is the issue of uh, self-awareness of the infinite worth of every person that is uh, the basis of uh, all the human rights. And then... Uh, all the other rights are coming from the social awareness, basically, the understanding of the fact that we need each other to live. There is this huge need for relationships that express itself in different ways according to the context, but basically it's still a need that, that binds us together. And all the rights are just the description, basically, of the of a way of living that our societies have molded over the years. And these uh, rights that are universal, they are universal because basically they describe common issues across the societies. Maybe societies look at enacting them from different perspective, but uh, the, 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 the basic human rights are not... Uh, an imposition from above, but basically are a recognition of the normal and common standard of living of our society. And we all recognize that these are true. Then, of course, some societies are coming at different paces, but the life skills are somehow the uh, both of the means and the reasons why human rights exist somehow. Yeah, very well put. Thank you, Dr. Morrow. Uh, Tessie, quickly, a response to how do we integrate this in curriculums? Yes, thank you for the questions. Uh, I, I will take it uh, from Indonesia perspective. Now Indonesia is uh, with the new policies that what we call it Merdeka Belajar, or in English that uh, emancipated learning that uh, we all curriculum has to be outcome-based education. So when it, how we integrate the life skills into the curriculum. So uh, uh, what uh, we create integrated project where the integrated uh, the project is based on experiential learning, mostly project-based learning or problem-based learning or, or team-based uh, education. So with the new uh, 
with the new policy that allow the students to go beyond the classroom because it's like uh, you're not just in the in the classroom you more about discussions but you learn outside of the classroom with the because now with the lms mooc students can learn from everywhere mm -hmm. so now how they use the knowledge into solving the uh, problem having a project integrated project connect with the others to solve the specific problem so that's already start from primary schools here in indonesia since 2020 and uh, that's uh, for uh, that's for third grade until the higher education level so the uh, my answer is we are using outcome based educations having integrated project applied uh, project-based education and uh, project-based learning and problem-based learning. Desi. Thank you. Thank you, Desi. I'm sure we can unpack that a lot more to actually go into the specifics of how to integrate life skills curriculums into uh, mainstream curriculums. Uh, but we run out of time, and I know I could continue to have conversations with each one of you going into depth of each of your work, uh, which sounds quite remarkable. Uh, but what I'm taking away from this conversation is uh, with all these massive movements for transforming education happening in different parts of the world and uh, the importance that's increasingly given to repurposing the idea of education to human flourishing or thriving and well-being uh, and the role, role that life skills and social emotional learning uh, can critically play in, in this transformation of education is well on its way. And what we're hoping is in a few years from now, the fundamental experience of learning for every child across the world will be different. Uh, and we'll be able to bring in values of equity and justice and inclusion into education through this. So thank you again for, for your time. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Uh, uh, look forward to interacting with you further again. Uh, thank you everyone for listening in to us. Uh, Hopefully, we'll connect with everyone at a future date. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us.